Welcome back for another deep dive. Ready to uh, take a little trip back in time? Always up for a good time warp. Okay, so picture this London, 1660s. But forget the London you might be picturing with, you know, Big Ben and fancy phone booths. Right, this is a, a totally different London. Exactly. This London is a whole other beast. Think cobblestone streets, horses everywhere, and uh, let's just say... Things didn't exactly smell like roses. Yeah, you wouldn't want to be caught without a handkerchief, that's for sure. More like a gas mask, am I right? Yeah. But seriously, this wasn't just about the sights and smells, right? This was a time when people saw the world in a totally different way. Oh, absolutely. I mean, can you imagine believing that a comet streaking across the sky was a sign of, like, the apocalypse? And not just believing it, but, like, really believing it. Like, heart and soul, the world is ending kind of believing it. Intense, right? Totally. They were convinced that the world had been going downhill since, you know, Adam and Eve. Wow. So to wake up every day with that sense of doom and gloom, that's heavy stuff. Heavy is an understatement. But here's the thing. Even with all that going on, there was this small group of people who, well, they decided to look at things a little differently. You mean the Royal Society? Bingo. These guys were like, okay, enough with all the doom and gloom. Let's try to figure out how this whole universe thing actually works. And they weren't messing around, right? They were all about observation, experimentation, actually testing things out. Pretty radical concept back then. Totally. It was like a tiny seed sprouting in the middle of a, I don't know, a, a dusty old library or something. I love that analogy. And that tiny seed, as we know, grew into something massive, something that would change the world as we know it. And it wasn't just their ideas that were revolutionary. It was their whole approach to knowledge. They were like, hey, knowledge shouldn't be this big secret. It should be shared. So they were like the original open source movement, centuries before the Internet. Exactly. They believed in collaboration in bouncing ideas off each other, even if those ideas seemed, well, a little out there at times. And I'm guessing some of those ideas were more than a little out there. Oh, for sure. You had guys like Sir Kenelm Digby, a member of the Royal Society, who believed in things like weapon salve. Weapon salve. Okay, now you have to explain that one because I have no idea what you're talking about. So imagine this. You get injured, right? Yeah. But instead of treating the actual wound, you put this special salve on the weapon that caused the injury. Wait, seriously? They thought that would work? Yep. And get this. Digby's recipe called for things like moss from the skull of an unburied man. Crazy, right? Okay, that's just creepy. It sounds like something straight out of a horror movie. It does, doesn't it? But that just goes to show how blurry the lines between science and, well, magic were back then. They were trying to make sense of the world, and sometimes that meant mixing what we now consider science with a hefty dose of the supernatural. So how did they go from weapon salve to, you know, the laws of physics? That's quite a leap. It was a process, for sure. And that's where figures like Robert Boyle come in. He was all about this new, open approach to knowledge. He believed in sharing ideas and collaborating, and he wasn't afraid to challenge the old ways of thinking. So Boyle was like the voice of reason in a sea of, well, skull moss and weapons of? Exactly. He was a crucial figure in shaping the Royal Society's commitment to open inquiry and collaboration. And that, my friend, is what laid the groundwork for the scientific revolution. So yeah, we were talking about the Royal Society and their uh, their quest to unlock the universe's secrets. And we can't talk about that without talking about this guy, Isaac Newton. Talk about a brain. Right. Yeah, Newton, he's like the rock star of science. But he was also like a super introvert, right? I mean, can you imagine this guy who basically wrote the book on gravity also spending hours and hours trying to like turn lead into gold? It's pretty wild when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, this is the guy who gave us calculus, cracked the code of gravity, and yet he was also fascinated by alchemy, something we'd probably consider more like the mystical mumbo jumbo today. But for Newton, it was all connected. So he was trying to find the connection between like magic and math. That's a kind of wild concept. Yeah. But didn't the Royal Society like pride themselves on being open and sharing their findings? It seems like Newton was... Uh, a bit secretive, wouldn't you say? Oh, for sure. Newton was notoriously secretive, especially about his work, his book, Principia Mathematica. It's like the Bible of physics, yeah. but it's so dense and complex that even mathematicians have a tough time with it. So even with this group that's like, hey, let's share everything, you've still got these clashes. It's like they're wrestling with these huge questions about knowledge and how it should be used, stuff we're still dealing with today. Totally. And that brings us to the heart of this whole scientific revolution thing. They had this idea, right? 
that the universe wasn't just like random chaos. It followed rules, laws. And those laws, well, they could be figured out with math. So are we talking like a giant cosmic clock, everything perfectly ordered and predictable? Basically, it was a huge shift. It wasn't about asking why anymore, like Aristotle and those guys. These new scientists, they were all about how. How does it work? How can we measure it? They wanted to describe the universe with numbers. So instead of looking at a beautiful sunset and writing a poem, they wanted to, like, calculate the wavelengths of the light. Exactly. It was about finding the patterns, the underlying structure of the universe. And that led to all these new questions, new discoveries. It paved the way for, well, pretty much all of modern science. But it must have been incredibly challenging, too, right? Like, trying to pin down a moving target. Take instantaneous speed, for example. How do you even begin to measure something that happens in an instant? It's like trying to grab hold of a lightning bolt. And that, my friend, is where calculus comes in. It was the tool they needed to make sense of these really tricky concepts, like infinity and instantaneous change. Okay, so we're talking about really big ideas here. Infinity. Instantaneous speed makes my head spin just thinking about it. But how did they even begin to wrap their minds around this stuff? It took a special kind of genius. And it turns out there were two geniuses working on this problem at the same time. Newton, of course, but also this German mathematician, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Both of them independently came up with calculus. Two guys, same idea at the same time. You're kidding. What are the chances? Talk about a recipe for uh, a little academic rivalry. Oh, yeah. This wasn't just a friendly competition. This was a full-blown feud. And when I say feud, I mean accusations of plagiarism, backstabbing, the whole works. It got pretty nasty. And I thought academics were above all that drama. It sounds like even geniuses can get a little uh, competitive. So who won? <laughs> who gets to be the king of calculus? Well, that's the thing. There wasn't really a clear winner. Both Newton and Leibniz made major contributions to calculus, and their work changed the game forever. So a draw. I have to say, I'm a little disappointed. I was hoping for a more dramatic ending to that story, but I guess that's how it goes sometimes even with the biggest brains in history. And you know what? Even though it was messy, this whole feud actually helped to advance calculus. It brought more attention to it, got people talking, and eventually led to it being used more widely. So sometimes even a good old-fashioned academic brawl can be good for science in the long run. Exactly. Sometimes the best ideas come from a little friction, you know? And this clash of titans, well, it helped to spark a mathematical revolution. Amazing. And I'm guessing that revolution had some pretty big consequences. You could say that again. But that, my friend, is a story for the next part of our deep dive. All right. So we've journeyed back to 17th century London, met the pioneers of the Royal Society, and even gotten a little tangled up in a calculus feud. But now let's step back and think about the bigger picture. What does it all mean? What's the legacy of this whole clockwork universe idea? Well, it's a legacy that's still unfolding even today. This shift from a world ruled by mystery to one governed by, like, discoverable laws. That's huge. It's the foundation of how we understand, well, everything. It's like they handed us a new set of glasses to see the world with, right? Totally. And Newton's laws of motion, they were game changers. I mean, sure, Einstein came along later and, you know, added a few wrinkles, but... Newton's work was the bedrock of physics for centuries. It's mind-blowing how they figured all this out without, like, the internet or computers or anything. But it wasn't just about science, right? This idea that God was a mathematician, a cosmic architect, that must have had a huge impact on religion, too. Absolutely. It made people rethink their relationship with the divine. Suddenly, God wasn't just this, like, distant figure, but a master mathematician who had designed the universe with incredible precision. It's like finding a hidden message, a secret code, embedded in the fabric of reality. Exactly. And for Newton, that code was math. For him, science wasn't about disproving God, but about understanding his creation on a deeper level. So it wasn't science versus religion, but rather science illuminating the divine. Exactly. And it's a conversation that's still going on today, centuries later. But even with all the amazing discoveries they made, there are still some pretty big mysteries left unsolved. Mysteries like, what is gravity, really? And where does the consciousness fit into all of this? Those are the million dollar questions, right? And it makes you wonder, if those 17th century minds could see us now, what would they think? Would they be amazed by how far we've come or maybe a little disappointed that we haven't figured it all out yet? I think they'd be blown away by our technology, but also inspired by the fact that we're still asking the big questions.
that we haven't lost that sense of wonder, that drive to understand the universe and our place in it. That's the beauty of science, isn't it? It's not about having all the answers. It's about the journey, the constant exploration. Absolutely. And sometimes it's about looking back in time, revisiting those pivotal moments when our understanding of the universe took a dramatic leap forward. It's about remembering the giants who came before us, those brave thinkers who dared to challenge the status quo and reshape our view of the cosmos. Couldn't have said it better myself. So here's to the Royal Society, to Newton, to Leibniz, and to all those who dared to imagine a clockwork universe. Their legacy lives on in every scientific discovery, in every question we ask, and in that unyielding human desire to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, and until next time, keep exploring.